Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. This episode is brought to you in part by Kind. Kind makes delicious, healthy snacks using whole ingredients. If you guys haven't tried it yet, their pressed bars by Kind are the best, in my opinion. Go try the mango apple chia. It's awesome. We've got a special offer for you guys to try 20 Kind snacks with their new snack pack. You can enjoy 50% off and free shipping on your first snack pack when you subscribe to it through Snack Club, which is Kind's monthly snacks subscription service. Go to kindsnacks.com slash sports for more details. That's kindsnacks.com slash sports to learn more and to subscribe to the snack pack. Hey guys, this next ASP story series will be from Nancy Pfeiffer reading from her book, Writing into the Heart of Patagonia. You can catch her full interview on episode 322. Her website will have all the information about her and her book, and it's nancypfeiffer.com. This reading will be from Chapter 1. Now enjoy. Riding into the Heart of Patagonia, Part 2. Ten years and thousands of kilometers of rugged horse trail later, Patagonia is in trouble. Multinational companies are lobbying to dam Patagonia's largest rivers and run a high-tension electric line the length of this long, thin country. The people of Patagonia are adamantly against the idea. But how do people living in small villages and on remote farms gain a voice? They hold a cabalgata, a 330-kilometer horseback ride, protesting the dams. We started as 30 people in Cochrane. Ten days later, we arrived in the capital, city of Koyaiki, as 125 people on horseback. Here's the story of our final days. We could sense the grand finale coming. 89-year-old Don Cecilio Olivares rode at the front of the pack, along with four-year-old Romina and her family. The herd energy peaked as we rounded the last bend. Just ahead was the Knowles Campo, where we would spend our last night on the trail. We were only 12 kilometers outside of Coyhaique. The entire Knowles staff cheered us on from the corner of the property. The horses broke into a spontaneous gallop as we neared the gate. No one held them back. Thundering up the hill past Sergio and Veronica's house, I saw myself as I had been so many years before, a neophyte on a Tobiana Yewa, closing the campo gate, swinging her leg up over a tremendous load of gear, and tentatively riding off alone into Patagonia. Today, like a character in an old western movie, I galloped across the finish line. Victorious already, we had arrived. While we waited at the Knowles Campo, a meeting between the city officials and the organizers of the ride was going on in Coyhaique. Rumors about our entrance into town had been running rampant for a week. We might not get permission to enter the city. They won't let us ride into town on the main street, Calle Prat. They will try to shuttle us down some back road where people won't see us. My friend Lily had been chosen to represent Puerto Ibanez at the meeting. I trusted her to fill me in. The possibility of us traveling more than 300 kilometers to be denied the right to enter the city worried me. Was all this fuss really about a little horse shit in the plaza? Or was some government official trying to keep us quiet, hoping that authorization for the dam project would get pushed through just as unobtrusively? I knew one thing. After riding all this way to have their voices heard, these tough, matter-of-fact ranchers were not going to go home and let their land be flooded. At least a large portion of us would ride into Koyaki the next morning, with or without permission. Images of people gunned down during the Pinochet era for far less blatant protest than standing in the plaza with a horse flashed unbidden into my head. That was then. Things were different now, I reminded myself. I am probably safer protesting here than in my own country these days, I told myself to ease my anxiety. Still, I was scared. What if things went wrong, got ugly? Visions of Adakin and I galloping down a back alley, outrunning the police, and slipping off into the countryside entertained my mind. At least I had a fast horse. More than 120 people crowded into the dining hall to wait for the word. Clusters of people chatted quietly in corners. 
Gone was the festive atmosphere that had traveled with the Cavalgata since Cochrane. It was time for business. After what seemed like hours, Don Cecilio stepped to the microphone. The room fell silent. The respect the crowd had for this man was palpable. He knew what we wanted to hear and went straight to the point. We have permission, he said. Tomorrow we will enter by Calle Pratt. A collective exhale of relief flooded the room. The next day, we would arrive in Coyhaique, in style, on the main street, and with permission from the city. Later, Lily filled me in on the meeting. The governor of the province was entirely against letting us enter by the main street, she told me, but he was also Patagon. He went to high school with many of the men involved in the march. The men in the room had greeted each other with polite embraces before sitting down on opposite sides of the table. This will be a peaceful demonstration, Don Cecilio had assured the governor. We come with families, women, and children. We are here to have our voices respectfully heard. We must also show respect. Representatives of each of the communities we had passed through sat around a rectangular table and echoed his viewpoint, reiterating the importance of entering on the main street of commerce. The gobernador had sat with his arms crossed in front of his chest throughout the meeting, apparently unmovable in his stance, but in the end, he had granted permission. Back in the dining hall, Marco Diaz of the Defensores del Espiritu de la Patagonia stepped up to the microphone. The city officials are worried about the disturbance of having horses in town. Yes, we will cause the people of Coyhaique a small disturbance tomorrow, he admitted. But better that than the disturbance of a 2,400-kilometer power line in the future. The room broke into applause. I didn't entirely agree. Rather than a disturbance... I believed we would be giving the people of Coyhaique a gift. Their own heritage, riding into town on horseback, bringing the stories and songs of their childhood, and a chance to redirect their future. Agolino took the floor. Again, the room hushed. Tomorrow, there can be no arguments, no strong disagreements, and no violence of any kind or a cause will be lost. Again, there was total agreement in the crowd. To this purpose, we must leave our knives behind. Everyone started talking at once. Heated discussions in all corners of the room made it impossible to hear. Carrying a knife, carefully sheathed, and stored in a belt is a rural Patagonian tradition. In the countryside, a knife, used to shoe a horse, sever an overhanging branch, or carve roasted meat off a bone, was a necessity. However, it was illegal to carry large knives in the city. Knives are part of our culture, a voice protested from the audience. Yes, knives are part of our culture, Agolino agreed, but this demonstration is not about knives. It's about dams. A heated discussion ensued. In the end, it was left to the individual to decide. In the morning, most knives would be left behind. That evening, a friend reminded me of something I had not considered. I was in Chile on a tourist visa. No matter how much I loved this place, officially, that was what I was. As a tourist, it was illegal for me to participate in any political activity. This ride could be seen as exactly that. I thought for a moment of all I stood to lose but my own risks paled in comparison to what Patagonia stood to lose. If I was taking a chance, it was one I was happy to take. I, like my neighbors, was not turning around now. The next day, however, just before entering town, I would carefully tuck my incriminatingly blonde hair up under my hat. The next morning, blooming lupins lined the road for the last dozen kilometers of our ride. We passed Laguna Foitzik, where I had gone looking for a saddle, for Nimbus so long ago. We rode by the blue cement shrine of San Sebastian, the patron saint of set travelers, where every driver of every car I had ridden in over the past 15 years had honked its horn. It felt as if I were watching a familiar show through someone else's eyes. Three abreast, rows of well-groomed horses extended over hills and around bends farther than I could see. Riders carried banners from their home regions, Rio Neff, Rio del Salto, Puerto Betran, Via Castillo. We moved not as a band of trail weary, beaten down campesinos with hundreds of kilometers behind us. Instead, we marched with flags flying, as if in a parade. Several kilometers from the edge of town, a chubby ten year old boy in a red and green sweatshirt became our first official greeter. He stood alone beside the road, holding a handwritten sign above his head Bienvenidos a Coyhaique, no a las represas. Welcome to Coyhaique, no to dams. Outside of town, new houses had sprung up like the legendary Casa Sprujas nearly overnight. 
unlike the original settlers who had nestled modest homes into the hollows of the countryside to escape the Patagonian wind, these were opulent structures, poorly placed on the landscape, suburban homes sprouting up on what had recently been farmland. It was happening all over the world, a not-so-gentle reminder that the population of the planet had doubled in my lifetime. Hey, ASP listeners, have you ever tried a Kind Bar? You may have seen them in your local grocery store, coffee shop, or gym. They make delicious, healthy snacks using whole ingredients. Well, if you're ready to try some tasty and healthy snacks, we've got a special deal for you. Try 20 Kind Snacks from seven of their unique product lines with their new snack pack. You can enjoy 50% off and free shipping on your first snack pack when you subscribe to it through their Snack Club. Snack Club is Kind's monthly snack subscription service. Go to kindsnacks.com slash sports for more details on that. I love their pressed bars like the mango apple chia bars, or I pretty much guarantee you're going to love their breakfast bars first thing in the morning when you climb out of that hammock. So take a minute and see what they're creating over at kindsnacks.com slash sports and get your 50% off plus free shipping on your first order. That's kindsnacks.com slash sports. Bent Gate Mountaineering, located in Golden, Colorado, has been outfitting backcountry travelers for more than 20 years. The snow is melting and the crags are drying out. Time to break out the hiking boots, rock climbing shoes, and tents. Gear materials and designs are more evolved than ever. From the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics, Bent Gate has the premier brands for climbing, hiking, and camping essentials, including Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice on destinations, getting started, or on fine-tuning your quiver of gear? The Bent Gate staff are all passionate adventurers who can give you the data and advice you need. Bentgate is also hosting numerous events and speakers this summer, so please check out their events page at bentgate.com for more information as well as to see their full product selection. As we entered Koyake, our reception was well beyond anything I had imagined. Kaye Pratt was packed. People stood waving on top of cars draped with banners proclaiming No Endesa and Rios Libre. Pancho's wife, Cucci, held chubby one-year-old Lorenzo in one arm and waved wildly at me with the other. Corey, his wife, Malinka, and their new baby girl, Mila, cheered us on from the other corner. Gone was the horse parking lot at the edge of town. A giant Sodimac, the Chilean version of Home Depot, stood in its place. These days... Even during the afternoon siesta, the square bustled with people in business suits. The pleasant, small town I had come from 15 years ago had somehow become a city. Waves of dark heads filled the streets and flowed with us into the plaza as we marched down Calle Prat. Hundreds of tiny Chilean flags, waved by riders and watchers alike, reminded me that these people were not here to resist Chile. They were here because they loved their country and wanted to protect it. We were not the only people who had traveled a long way to be there that day. Signs marked the gathering places for people from outlying communities. Bahia Muerta, Tortel, Rio Tranquilo, Manuales, Niriwao. I saw folks from Cochrane and Lago Verde. I caught glimpses of people I hadn't seen in years. My urge to stop and share a beso with old friends was pushed aside by the momentum of the parade. I could only wave wildly as familiar faces appeared and then disappeared into the crowd. My spirit soared with the power of waving flags and yelling in unison, Endesa, entiende, la vida no se vende. Endesa, understand, life is not for sale. But while observing a moment of silence, outside Endesa's hydrocent office in Coyhaique, I cried silently into my sunglasses. We circled the plaza once and pulled our horses to stop while the entire crowd sang the national anthem. Pure chili is your blue sky. Pure breezes cross you as well. Your flower-embroidered fields are the happy copy of Eden. The crowd sang loudly and sweetly. I said in awkward silence. I had not learned the Chilean national anthem in school. We circled the plaza again and stopped in front of the municipality building to await the attention of local government officials. We were going to have a long wait. The intendente of the region, Vivianta Ventacourt, had decided to travel 570 kilometers to Vio Higgins that day. Don Cecilio, in his white-collared shirt, and slate gray suit coat sat astride his leggy alasan. The Chilean flag leaning on his left shoulder, he spoke eloquently to local and national news reporters. We do not want to dam the Baca River. We do not want to destroy our fatherland, this place where we have lived for generations. It is for our children. Why now? 
We understand this country is short on energy, but we cannot change this thing by destroying another thing. Don Cecilio's wisdom touched closely on the words of Albert Einstein. Significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. One by one, people took the microphone. A man in a business suit spoke for the rural people. The pobladores of Aysen understand that they live in a privileged place. They love the land and know the importance of protecting our natural resources for themselves and for their children. I also understood a bigger picture. This land and this life have value beyond what someone will pay. At a time when people throughout the world are trying to figure out how to live more sustainable lives, an intact system of working family farms is an asset the planet cannot afford to lose. All afternoon, people told their stories, their family stories and the stories of the history of this place. Six horses abreast, Arakin and I stood, packed nose to butt, with the other horses in the searing sun. By mid-morning, the heat was oppressive. Off came my hat and out tumbled unruly locks of long blonde hair. Gringer or not, I was hot. What seemed like interminable hours passed without food or water. Eventually, a man came around with water for the horses. But few of these horses, accustomed to drinking free-flowing water from a stream, had any interest in drinking chlorinated water from a plastic bucket. Several hours into our wait, I noticed a man in a green uniform staring directly at me. Three horses from the edge in either direction, I was trapped in the crowd. My fantasy of gall galloping off down some winding back alley should I be approached by the police vanished. There was nothing to do but avert my blue eyes. The man approached directly towards me through the mass of riders. Looking firmly down, I studied the pavement. But there was no denying it. I was Gringa, and I was there. I felt an unmistakable tap on my knee. Resigned to my fate, I turned. The confused face of my friend Orlando looked back at me. Orlando was a park ranger. He wore the green uniform of all Chilean Guadalaparques, which I had confused with the uniform of the Carboneros, the police. Orlando, como estas? I asked, embarrassed, trying to pretend I hadn't just been hiding from him. Tanto tiempo, amiga, he greeted me. It's been a long time, friend. It had been a long time. Fifteen years. Orlando was a student on my first Knowles course in Patagonia. He still looked exactly as I remembered him. Memories of a time when I barely spoke Spanish, yet had desperately wanted to learn even a portion of what he knew about the Patagonia forest, flashed through my mind. How had we managed to miss each other in the same town for 15 years? We promised to find each other later. We could find some shade and chat. He disappeared into the crowd. I never saw him again. In the plaza, the celebration that had been growing for 10 days blossomed to include the entire town. The band Mate Amargo strummed its first chord on the makeshift stage, and traditional music and dancing filled the plaza. Over the course of the day, the incredible privilege of sharing this historical moment, of riding alongside the people I respected most in the world, soaked in. But something else, something more uncomfortable, was slipping in as well. An idea I had been stuffing conveniently into the back of my mind for a long time kept bubbling to the surface. Someone needed to tell the story of this place. Almost with a sense of relief, I felt it wasn't my story to tell. This was Patagonia's story. But the idea kept haunting me. Maybe because I came from a place that already had way too many roads and dams and power lines. Because I came from a place where life went on at an ever increasingly unhappy and unhealthy pace. This was indeed my story to tell. Late into the afternoon, we were still waiting for government officials to acknowledge our presence. Remember in the morning in Via, Via Cerro Castillo, when after nearly an all-night party, a hundred people and their horses rode out at 6 a.m. gave me hope. The fortitude of these people and their horses, and the fact that an incredibly complex event like the Cabalgatas and Represas had been immaculately organized and run, gave me confidence in our ability to win. Hot, tired, thirsty, and in need of a public restroom, I looked around for Lily. Five hours into our wait, we took turns holding each other's horses for a few moments so we could take care of our most basic needs. My companions chatted casually from astride their horses, apparently unconcerned about how much longer we would be standing there. Patagonians wait for the rain to stop. They wait for the river to go down. They wait for spring to come and their lambs to get fat. Doing business in Patagonia, as I had repeatedly learned, requires long periods of waiting. 
nor did anyone other than me seem distressed by the fact that we had no idea what was going on behind the closed doors of the municipality building. I wanted desperately to be Patagon, to accept life's uncertainties easily and with grace. But the North American side of me had grown up in the age of information. Unaccustomed to being uninformed, I shifted constantly in my seat, fidgeting with my reins. Late that afternoon, Viviante Ventecourt, who had been appointed Intendente for the region by La Presidenta Michelle Bachelet herself, returned from O'Higgins and quietly slipped in the back doors of the municipal building. Chairs reserved for the local elected officials sat empty in the plaza. No one was stepping forward to shake hands with their constituents on this day. We still held in our hands the document Declaration for I Send, a simple seven-point list of requests and concerns we intended to pass along to the Intendente. We would remain until we did. Seven hours into our wait, Agolino, Don Cecilio, and a few key spokesmen from our group were allowed inside. Most of the riders had no idea what was going on, nor how much longer we would be waiting. The only thing I knew for sure was that when the sun sank below the snow-covered mountains, the heat we had suffered all day would instantly change to bitter cold. I had a wool hat, but it had left my warm coat behind. After hours of careful negotiation, Viviante Ventecourt walked out into the street, where her picture was taken with Agalino Olivares. The photo shows a red-headed woman with big glasses, smiling beside Agalino and waving a Chilean flag. She had read and acknowledged our requests. That evening, Sergio and I galloped side by side back to the campo. As we thundered past miles of Lupin, I knew I would write this story. I would begin this journey the same way I had taken off across Patagonia, with no idea what I was up against, no formal training, and no clear-cut picture of what was ahead. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of ASP Stories with Nancy Pfeiffer. As I said, you can go check out Nancy's full interview on episode 322. Have you signed up as an ASP patron yet over at patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast? We've launched our new Life Outside the Box series for patrons only. Go check it out. As a patron, you'll also be entered into contests where we're going to be giving away certain demo products that we reviewed as well as books. And you'll have opportunities to ask questions of future guests and maybe even co-host a podcast yourself. So check it out. as patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast. Thanks, guys. And now get out there and have some fun. Adventure Sports Podcast.